Hey, I've got a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Who wants to go from naught to 150 in 10 seconds? I have no idea. Who? It's a lady called Laura Jones, RVN. I'm going to get her on and ask her. Brilliant. Go on then. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Laura. Oh, shall I ask the important question, Mike, or will you? Well, Did we I want to into it? I want to ask the important question, but yeah, I guess. Well, yeah. Go on. I no. I asked. I asked Alaskas. No, go, no, you, you ask. No, no, no. You, no. Know, so you do it with a lot more compassion than I do. I, I sort of I blurt the question out. Yeah, it yeah. I know, but it, it's it's probably the critical question that that every listener needs to know. They're going to need to know. They're going to want to know. Uh, okay, I'll 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 try my best. You know, we can we can always call call a timeout and re-record if necessary. We we could. If it doesn't if it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Don't, don't be so, frightened. Don't be frightened, Laura. Oh, that's very gentle. Okay, I, I think so. So, um, Laura, uh, there's a lot of our listeners uh, are very keen to hear. I um, mean, you've been an RVN for for quite a while, and you work at a at a very distinguished. Um, referral centre um, but what most of our listeners I think really need to know is what is your favourite bread? Oh that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, oh I like a good like dark rice sourdough Ooh. with like some nice yeah, butter have... and a good bowl of soup especially now it's the right time of year for it. It is isn't it? Salted butter? Yes. Unsalted butter or or here's a suggestion, unsalted butter with Himalayan pink salt grated on top. Well, that's a very bougie option. I quite like that one. Not that I've ever tried it, but I might now. Give it a go. It that sounds like it could be life-changing. Halen, is it Halen Mill? Who are the ones who do the um, the posh salt? There's a Welsh company that's really posh salt. Celery salt. And, um, All right. Tangerine salt. And I've got some black Icelandic smoked salt in the cupboard. I feel like my salt in the cupboard is really, really poor in comparison to yours. I need to like broaden my salt horizons here. <laughs> you, you can't, uh, you can't overdo it on the salt front. Well, oh you, no, you can actually, can't you? Yes, you, no, you can. can. You can mm. definitely. Yeah, that would be a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> and hypertension is one of the uh, key side effects, is it not? It is, yes, of chronic uh, hypersalination. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it makes you thirsty. I think it's wine. Cheers. You have a drink of wine. There we go. Yeah, I like the idea of that. How's that peach juice working out for you? I think it would definitely be better if it had some champagne in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Laura, you you just you just wowed us. You just wowed us. Completely. <laughs> this is definitely ramblings for you. Why on earth, Laura? Why on earth do you want to be a veterinary nurse? Sorry, I read that all wrong. Yes. What made you decide to become a veterinary nurse, Laura? <laughs> completely wrong, Julian. <laughs> well, initially, I actually wanted to be a vet. Did you? I feel like that happens quite a lot, right? Lots of people decide when they're kind of figuring out what they want to do with their life and career at 16 because everyone apparently at 16 knows exactly what they want to do for the rest of their life they yeah. go oh I'm going to be a vet I'm going to work with animals so I started doing my A-levels and then in the middle of my A-levels I got really bad glandular fever and had to take quite a long time off of college mm -hmm. and so I was faced with the dilemma of do I reset a year and then go to vet school and in the meantime I'd started doing more and more work experience to kind of bolster up my UCAS application. And in that time, I was working a lot with the nurses rather mm -hmm. than following mm -hmm. what the vets were doing. And until then, I hadn't really realised what nurses actually did until I actually saw it myself. That then made me realise that actually, I think that was what I had wanted to be doing the whole time. I just didn't actually know that that was its own thing. Yeah. So I dropped out of my A-levels and got a job as a student nurse in a practice up the road and started doing my apprenticeship then and there at 17. Good for you. How did your folks feel about that? Not great. <laughs> they 
they thought I was absolutely throwing my life away I'm sure and um all I can say is I'm glad it worked out the way it did because I think if I had gone to vet school I, d- I don't think well I know my career obviously wouldn't have followed the same journey as it has but I also don't think I'd have ended up with the same particular passions and interests and things as I have now yeah hmm. yeah let's talk about this passion oh, Mike, Mike sorry on story though is it Julian we, we we hear this quite a lot from uh, a lot of the people that we meet and yeah. uh, it, it's important to think to explain to some of the, the non-vet people that listen to the show I, I sort of ridiculed Julian a little bit there for saying, you know, what on earth made you want to become a vet nurse? You know, very, very badly phrased question. Um, because there it was is badly phrased for a reason, though, wasn't it? Well, it was, wasn't it? Which, which is why I'm giving the explanation that uh, there is this perception that the uh, that the nurse is not necessarily an integral member of the team. Most vets, of course, can't do their job without good nurses behind them because of the role that the nurses fulfil, the responsibilities and the skill sets that are particular and unique to the nurses that the vets don't necessarily have. So, um, Absolutely, absolutely. We, we are uh, a vet alone and a nurse alone are less than half of the product. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Sorry, Julian, you interrupted there. No, oh. no, I was going to say pretty much the same thing, actually. Right. Uh, it's it's often perceived, isn't it, as a as a second best. You wanted to be a vet, but you became a nurse. No, you wanted to be a vet, and then you saw the light and became a nurse. Yeah, I think that's a much better way of looking at it. I think if I had known to begin with what nurses actually did, yeah. and I'm glad that that's changing, but I definitely think that there's still quite a way to go in terms of public perception of our role. Mm. So I think lots of people think that being a vet is the only answer but actually when you really see what everyone in the different roles in the veterinary practice does it was I always wanted to be a nurse I just never actually knew that that's what it was called. Yeah and it's interesting that um, with human nurses and with uh, with veterinary nurses they're really the people that that the patients and clients actually listen to that they're the ones that get the information uh, as, as a vet, I can warble on quite happily to a client for ages, and then they'll go and ask the nurse what I meant. <laughs> what did he say? That's right. That, that short bloke, what did he want? Laura, what did he say? <laughs> it was going on about some stuff to do with my dog. I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> but that's so true, and I think that that's why, that's probably part of the reason why I love medicine so much, is because I get the opportunity to help clients with complicated diseases because I've worked in practices before where I've worked with specialists none of whom I work with in my current practice um, who've given clients like four page novels in all of the detail of the pets like diabetes for example and the client walks out completely overwhelmed looking at this like stack of paper just going what do I do with this information but actually Mm -hmm. you then have someone like a nurse that can come in kind of break it down and have a chat with them on a level that they perhaps find a bit less scary it really makes a huge difference yeah. you're absolutely right they're an approachable person whereas vets i think often aren't same as doctors uh, if you go and see a doctor you'll sit there looking a bit afraid in the chair and then you go out and you say to the nurse so am i gonna be all right or not and they say no <laughs> and if you're and if you're comforted don't you yeah them. absolutely Maybe that doesn't work. No, it absolutely does. I remember I was in hospital a few years ago and the consultant would come and see me in the morning and do their rounds and check me over. And then like the respiratory nurse would come and speak to me afterwards and I'd be like, oh, it's all fine. The nurse is here. Everything's great. I don't have to be scared anymore. Absolutely, because you know you're getting an answer from the nurse, whereas the doctor would just say, yeah, 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 I see. (laughs) Ask the nurse. Yeah. (laughs) So was this with your glandular fever? Oh, no, no, this was um, a really horrible chest infection on top of quite bad asthma. It wasn't fun. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah, try being the youngest person in the acute medical ward. Not very fun at the hospital. No, no try, try being the youngest person in uh, in your local drama group. <laughs> oh, no, that is, that is fun. That is, oh, that's a different thing. I was yeah, going to say, thing. That, is fun, that sounds much it? more fun. <laughs> it, does, it is, yeah, yeah. Even at his age. Well, 
I am, yeah, absolutely. So the, the grand old age of, I'm the youngest uh, member of my amateur dramatic group, so I'm often asked to, to play my own son or daughter. Quite, quite a strange thing. Like, are you an Andrammy sort of person, Laura? Me? Uh, I, hmm. No, not as much. Uh, definitely people in my family have, have done a lot with it, but I, I just don't have the time to kind of dedicate myself to anything extra remotely at the moment. I think I'm already spreading myself quite as thin as it is, to be honest. Uh, so stretching yourself, what, 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 do you, what do you do? Is it vet, 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 or nurse, 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 nurse? Yeah, a lot of it is, well, nurse, 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 nurse. nurse. Um, so work full-time in practice still, run like an educational platform outside of that for nurses, do quite a bit of speaking and teaching, and then around that, I also uh, kickbox and race motorbikes. So quite a lot. Well, do you, do you ever beat them? Well, the motorbikes. Or the, the, the motorbikes. They're quite <laughs> fast, aren't they? I, I, I could race snails and probably come in second or I could third. probably beat my 125. No, I probably couldn't, actually. <laughs> so so you're, you're on the motorbike while you're racing other people on motorbikes. Is that the thing, or...? It's um well it's drag racing mostly so it's like a pair going down the the lane. I my bike's being built currently, so I'll be competing next year. Wow, the centre pod that's that straight line. Yeah. Where the lights go, tick 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 tick, and then it go, and yeah. then after after yeah. what ten seconds of mind numbing speed and acceleration. You throw a parachute out the back and try and stop before you run off the end of the racetrack. Uh, no parachutes on ours. Mine might be going fast enough to parachute. The car's parachute, yeah, absolutely. But uh, my bike will probably go about maybe eleven seconds or so. Wow! And, and then you then you whiz off and rush through the shutdowns, the pits, cool the bike down, <laughs> get ready to do it all over again. Wow, that's great! I, I haven't. I will the. Uh, uh, the, the, the courage to do that. I mean, I'll, I'll happily throw myself uh, up a cliff and hopefully not, hopefully not off a cliff, but throw myself up a cliff. But I, I wouldn't have the, the ability to ride a bike in anything other than a snail space. Hey, hang fall on. Off. So, what speed do you finish? This is quarter mile racing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you start at zero. Yeah. And what speed do you finish the quarter mile at? Uh, it depends, really. So I'm not sure. Ex well, we haven't finished building my bike yet, so I'm not sure exactly what it will do. But my other half, he his, I think his terminal like top end speed is about 152, 153 miles an hour at the moment on his bike, and he'll do that in uh, eight point something seconds. That's that. That's it's downhill, presumably. Straight down, just flat. Straight flat. That's that's. That's um, almost as fast as speed skiers. Yeah. Actually, I'd do that on skis. Actually, I wouldn't. Mike, Mike does. Or Mike used to do that on skis. That's yeah. fast. That that's awesome. Yeah. That's crazy fast. It is quite fast, yeah. But I'm imagining it probably feels really like time stands still and also it's over before you know it all at the same time when you're actually doing the run. Have you done a run? Not properly, no. Not Certainly not that speed. So you're building a motorbike. Building it. And then the licensing runs are shorter. So I haven't done like a foot pass or anything yet. But yeah, that's next year's job. So have you have you so the licensing run, so you have to presumably you have to prove that you can handle this machine down the down the strip. Yeah, you have to launch, you have to do a 60 foot and then a half half of the track so an eighth of a mile and then they have to watch you then do a full quarter mile before they'll give you your license right and how far have you got so far uh like i haven't fully licensed yet because i have to do it on the on the actual bike i'm going to be racing on right okay i've just done a bit of playing around and that's all really we'll see hang on we'll come it'll be fine lend you his bike he could lend me his bike but uh it's it's going to be quite different to mine, let's put it that way. As in, here's the front end of it looks a bit like a choppery, like, city up thing. So yeah. he's doing 150 miles an hour sitting up with, like, the bars like this, like eight hangers, not, like, tucked down. I'm Mine's not going to be lying, like lying across this machine. Yeah, I'm going to be, like, lying across it flat. He's sitting up like this, having a lovely time. <laughs> okay. 
Wow. It's amazing. God, no, I, I couldn't do it. So. When, when, I, I'm, oh, this is fantastic. I'm loving this. So what, when are you going to do this? When's, when's your first launch for your pre-license going to be? Well, so the racetrack's just like closed for the season. So the Run What You Bruns start around February, March time, I think, next year. So finish the bike over Christmas, start running beginning of next year. Right. Come on, Laura. You're, you're smiling and you're laughing and you're looking very confident and calm about this. Is, have we got a swan thing going on here? I don't know. I mean, I've been, he's been doing it for a few years now and I crew for him. Right. When he, when he races. So yeah. I help him with the bike. I help him get ready for his runs. I'll like help him stage and get ready to launch and help him turn the bike around after all of the runs. Yeah. And you kind of naturally can't help but help with it and become part of, like, it's like a real family there. Everyone there is like family. You become part of it and you just end up naturally doing it. Mm -hmm. And so many people, I think, have ended up, have gone there with no intention to race and then seen everyone else do it and go, no, I want a bit of this, actually. So, uh, yeah. I, to be honest, I actually feel like that's, I'd rather do that than ride properly on the road. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like you've got actually far less chance of coming off or being injured or anything because you haven't got to worry about other people. Yeah. yeah. So what you're saying is you do motorbike drag racing at 150 miles an hour, but it's it's probably safer than we think. Yeah, basically. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm convinced. <laughs> I know I've probably yeah. really sold it to you at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can relate to that. And I think there's there's a... You've summarised it very nicely there. I used to be involved with Speedway. Um, there is a, there is a yes, there's an, a competitive element there, but it's a supportive family all doing our, our fun thing together. Yeah. And the smells and the noise and the atmosphere, and uh, it's, it's sort of strangely supportive. Yeah, and it's like it feels like an escape. The main reason I feel like I love being there so much is because it helps me completely switch off from veterinary life. Yeah, because I go there for two days. We stay on site, like we sleep in the back of a van on like an airbed, like with a heater and stuff. And you're just there. You barely get phone signal, so you can't really speak to the outside world. And you're just there with all your mates racing for two or three days, and then you go home back to reality again. Right. Yeah. Like like any sport, any pastime, whether it's um, playing international tiddlywinks or um, or driving a bike at a stupid mile an hour, uh, it's it does take you out of yourself, doesn't it? Yeah. I, yeah. you know, when I'm when I'm climbing or swimming or, or, or canoeing, I I'm just thinking about climbing or swimming or canoeing or or canoeing down a mountain. I sometimes think about it as well. I don't do it, but um, it it it, does, it takes you out of out of work mode and I think we all need that because it's a stressful job isn't it absolutely yeah. yeah has it become more stressful do you think since covid uh I think so I'm not sure if it's getting back to almost how it was but I I think on some level it's never going to be completely as it was prior to the pandemic I think it is definitely I feel like we're probably starting to get over some of the like acute strain on the profession that COVID put on us in terms of the emergencies only, the changes to caseload. I definitely don't feel like our staffing levels have, have gone back to normal in terms of, mm. I know a lot of people who left the profession during COVID or they got furloughed and then decided not to come back because the time off just kind of highlighted to them that the job was so stressful that they didn't feel that they, they wanted to return. But I think we're starting to get back to a no like normal or find a new normal, I guess, is probably a better way of putting it. That's a good point. Um, but, yeah. 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 And we lost people, of course, through, through Brexit as well, didn't we? Yeah. And that too. And the two decided to coincide just to make things extra stressful for us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> clients, I think, have changed, though. Definitely clients have become more, more demanding. That's yeah. not, maybe, maybe there's more to money of me. Have you had a bad diet, <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> I don't know. I work with medicine patients and, you know, sometimes we can see that our, uh, our clients are a little bit kind of more demanding just because 
these patients have quite complex diseases and we need quite a lot of information from them. So I'm used to dealing with uh, the odd demanding client. But I, yeah, I definitely think that the client's expectations, I think, have increased. I think the same as I'm sure ours have if we walk into our doctor's surgery or, or whatever. I, I think the pandemic's just changed everyone in so many ways that I think we all look at things quite differently now. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. You mentioned there that you you uh, work on um, on medicine, on yes. medicine patients, as opposed to, and again, this is for people that may not necessarily be part of the veterinary field, uh, as opposed to a more surgical um, basis. What got you into that? What what took you that direction? A complete accident, if I'm honest with you. Uh, yeah. So I. Yeah was working at a hospital uh, in Berkshire, up the road from me, like a GP hospital. I was in a nurse management role there and I didn't feel particularly fulfilled anymore. I felt like I'd kind of got everything out of the role and I was starting to wonder if I'd got everything out of the profession, to be honest, that I was going to. Okay. I knew I needed to change something in my main interests before then had been anaesthesia and surgery. Mm-hmm. There was a new referral centre opening up in Hampshire Uh, about half an hour away from me and I applied for a job there this was back in 2015 and they they basically said we'd like you to work for us here's a list of roles that are available the only department that no longer has any vacancies are the surgery and anesthesia teams take your pick of the rest Ah. (laughs) and one of the roles was deputy head nurse of the internal medicine service so I, I picked that one Okay. Um, that was seven years ago, and I've not really looked back since. Wow. What do you find most interesting about medicine? Is it, well, no, I won't put any ideas into my work. What, what do you find most interesting about medicine? Oh, I don't know, because I love all of it, but probably the complexity and like the problem solving aspect, and also mm-hmm. just the fact that no two patients are ever the same. Mm-hmm. Like the even with the same disease process, the way you manage them could be entirely different based on kind of concurrent diseases or differences within that disease process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true, isn't it? There is a, often a conundrum. See, I, I, I do mainly surgery. I, I do handle medical cases as well in the GP practice, but my, my real love is surgery. And that's, that's an instant fix, isn't it? And if it doesn't work, you pass it on to the medics and say, it's not, not me, I didn't do it. But... Um, there's probably something medical going on, if you wouldn't mind just having a look at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so do you do, you do your own, uh, own, own appointments in the clinics then, Laura? I do sometimes, yeah. I haven't done as many recently, um, purely because we've, well, to be honest, the patients that I saw most regularly, um, sadly, don't come back to see us anymore. But um, as in, they've passed away. And um, but yes, absolutely. We we you know we do see appointments as the nurses in my practice. So for you know regular patients like diabetics, chronic kidney disease, uh, various different conditions, we'll see for follow ups. We'll do things like their bloods, blood pressure, place mm-hmm. continuous glucose monitors, perform different diagnostics under the direction of the vet, provide advice on things like nutrition medication environment lifestyle that sort of thing mostly endocrine patients i would say and kidney disease patients are probably the ones i see most often mm. and, and they can be the most challenging can't they because really i guess what you're doing in most of those cases is improving the quality of life for whatever time they have left rather than curing them as such yeah absolutely working with the families to just maintain quality of life for as long as we can so Here's, here's an interesting question. Client says to you, but what is quality of life? How, how do you answer that? I, it's getting heavy for a Monday evening, isn't it? It well, is, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say that it's really the, the ability of their pet to be able to live what they feel is a, a happy, well-rounded life, not just their kind of physical day-to-day needs but like behaviorally emotionally as well so I tend to 
direct clients to places like Lap of Love or the How Do I Know If It's Time resources, not necessarily because we're making decisions about end of life, because I think that if quality of life, in my opinion, is something that we should discuss earlier rather than later so that it becomes a normal part of conversation and we're not bringing this up at a time where emotions are starting to run high. So I tend to direct them to that information, not to make end of life decisions, but so that they know what they should be looking out for and what they should be monitoring to see if there are any changes. So the usual stuff like eating, drinking, toileting, exercise, but also things like how they interact with their family, play, uh, other animals in the home, expressing normal behaviour, that sort of thing. Hmm. It's interesting. I, it, it was a bit, um, bit of an unfair question, I guess, and you, and you, you answered you answered it very well. We're not marking out of five because I don't know the correct answer to it. But <laughs> the reason the reason I asked was because I had um, three conversations today about quality of life with owners, and and each one went a different way because mm. we're directed, aren't we, by by the owners to a very great extent, and it. It led me to, to reaffirm something that I've, I've maintained for a long, long time that we don't, it's impossible to treat a pet on, on its own. We're, we're treating the pet and only unit, aren't we? Yeah. And we're, we're trying to work out a best fit for, for them. Yeah. And that best fit may be to do absolutely everything that, that, that veterinary medicine can throw at them to get their dog or cat or guinea pig or hamster better. Mm -hmm. Or to do as little intervention as possible to to to, to get it to um, a happy a happy state if we can use that term. Yeah. Um, and so we, we really just need to to be asking our clients what what they want, what their thought is. And, and mm. I answer that each time the the client said, "What what? How do we measure quality of life?" And I always sort of deflect about. Well, you tell me <laughs> but actually yeah. it, is, it is quite true isn't it they all have their own ideas and there is no yeah. right or wrong answer yeah absolutely and like you say so much of it is about managing not just the patient but the whole situation and, and the family scenario and everything as well like there were some really really good papers and they were published years ago but it was some uh, studies that I think were done at the RBC and it was the uh, apps that were used to assess quality of life in diabetic dogs and diabetic cats and the, the clients were asked lots of questions about factors that impact quality of life in their pet and the specific things that they were highlighting actually most of them were not to do with the patient they were to do with things like going on holiday how they were going to inject insulin the cost of the treatment leaving the pet with friends or family that sort of thing the impact it might have on the client's social life so a lot of factors that clients think of when they think quality of life are not always strictly to do with the patient themselves. And I think that's another reason why we as nurses can do so much to improve not just quality of life, but also perception of quality of life by supporting mm. clients with things like that. Mm. And I wonder if clients use nurses often enough for that. Just a thought. I don't, I don't think that they do, but I, I also don't know if that's because they perhaps don't know that nurses are able to do those things. Because I think most people would think that if a pet has an actual disease, they would need to see a vet. But if their pet needed a post-op check or a dental check or some flea and worming treatment prescribed, they could probably see a nurse. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That, 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 that's an interesting thing. Is there, is there a way to sort of close that gap or, or to to educate where where do we need to educate what do we need to do to sort of close that gap and open open those opportunities up for both the clients and for the nurses i think it probably needs addressing on all sides in terms of the nurses the clients and the vets as well because yeah. i think perhaps the vets don't always know exactly how much they can ask nurses to do in terms of support right and they may not always feel that they can delegate those things to a nurse mm -hmm. or it may be because the patient has an illness and they need to keep an eye on that case it may be easier for them to continue seeing that patient back themselves mm -hmm. I think a lot of nurses that I talk to about things like this don't feel that they know enough 
to be able to have these discussions with clients. They feel like they need to know the ins and outs of all of the diseases to have these discussions. And like, whilst yes, we need to have an underlying like knowledge of the disease and how it's affecting the patient, a lot of what we're discussing with clients is just getting information which we're going to pass on to the vet and then providing them advice on how to make their pet's life at home better. And we can absolutely do that without having an in-depth knowledge of diabetes, for example. And I also think that the clients need to know that that's actually a thing. So if they come out of an appointment with the vet and the vet says, okay, um, I, your cat has been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. We need to see them back in three months time for blood and a urine sample for restaging. I'm going to book you in to see the nurse and they will take the bloods. Please bring in a free cat urine sample with you and they'll also measure your cat's blood pressure at the same time. Right. so if the client's kind of told that the nurse can do those things I think there's likely to be a higher uptake of, of clients booking in those appointments um, I think it's just about working as a team like the client the nurse and the vet together all to improve quality of life for the pet you, you you've covered a whole series of things there that that mm. we've heard a number of times before I just wonder what your your advice or your take on this would be because to a certain extent, in what you've just said, you could suggest that nurses are sometimes backward in coming forwards, or that they could be coming forwards within their own team to say, I can do this. There was a hint there of thinking that they need, that you need to know all of the ins and outs of a disease process, et cetera, et cetera, when possibly you don't because that's not what's required in that particular instance. And probably you, you, were, you were hinting there about something we've discussed many times, which is empathy mm. and having yeah. that empathetic approach. Um, is there anything, what can we do to help nurses put themselves forwards into these roles, into the team? And, and to enable them to fulfil the roles that you've just described more efficiently or more effectively or more confidently? That is a very big question. And I think... You brought it up. I did, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, made it rough for my own back here, haven't I? It's your fault. <laughs> it is all my fault. It's a huge question. I think that it can be easy as a nurse, and I speak for myself here, definitely, like thinking about kind of in the past for me, it can be easy to assume that because you're a nurse, you don't know enough to be able to do this or you're not able to do this because you're not a vet and a vet, sh a vet should be doing those things. Mm -hmm. So I think trying to kind of break away from that and encourage yourself to kind of get, get a little bit out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. or to not feel afraid to speak up if there's something that you want to be doing or you want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Because the only way that you're going to learn those things and actually get to practice those skills and develop them is by putting yourself out there. Yep. And if you don't feel that you know enough and you feel like you would feel much more confident holding those appointments if you learn a bit more about the disease process, either it's a good opportunity to do some CPD mm -hmm. or it could be a topic for a practice meeting or like a journal club or something like that. Or you could actually speak to your vet team about it speak to the vet who's in charge of that case, for example, and say, oh, I noticed that you saw this patient coming back in for a recheck today. I'd really like to be involved. Do you want me to see them next time that they need bloods and I can take them for you and then send the results to you? Mm -hmm. And so for me, my case is we have rounds in the morning with the, with the clinicians. Right. And if there's a patient that's booked in to see me, the clinician will talk to me about that patient and they'll mention any specific points, for example, that they want me to mention or find out for them. So that helps me feel more confident with what I'm discussing because I've, I've had an overview of the case beforehand or I've spoken to the vet about it. So yeah. if there's anything that, that you know, a nurse wants to know, for example, before feeling confident enough to do that clinic, have a chat with the vet beforehand and just say like what do you think I need to know and what do you want me to find out for you mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is just having the confidence to be able to say yes I can do that and 
I think a lot of the time it's us getting in our own way, perhaps slightly, because of the fact that we feel like we sh- we don't know as much. Mm-hmm. I definitely have always felt like I've needed to prove myself or like, oh, I'll feel good enough once I've done this course and once I've done this course and oh, well, once I've done my top up degree, then I'll feel like I'm a good nurse and stuff. But actually, all that happens is you do that and you go, oh, well, I know more now, which is great. But actually, I don't really feel any different. And, and so what advice would you give then perhaps to to a, a younger nurse or, or, or a younger vet setting out and being afraid of of being an imposter or, or being afraid of the workload and not being able to cope i think Pick a subject any subject <laughs> and advise them. What, what would you advise them? what's their quality of life got to advise them that oh my gosh i think in terms of kind of coping with the stress of veterinary practice for me i remember when i was a student always feeling like i had to prove myself always feeling like i needed to show that i knew what i was doing show that i could already perform all of these skills really competently and that i knew what was going on with the patients like you don't need to you're in a training position or you're new in your career or you're newly graduated you're there to learn it's okay for you to not have all of the answers it's okay to say actually i'm not familiar with that could you please talk to me about it or actually i could do with a hand with this please would you be able to help me no one is going to feel bad, think badly of you. People will be grateful for the fact that you've actually reached out and mentioned that it's something that you might need a bit of extra help with. Mm-hmm. When I look back at my career when I was younger, probably coupled with age, right? Because I started nursing when I was 17, 18. Mm-hmm. Like, I was basically a child. <laughs> so <laughs> I wish that I had actually stood up and... and kind of verbalized more the things that I was less confident with instead of feeling like I had to prove that I knew everything I think it would have made me a better nurse and I think it would have definitely have helped me kind of feel more comfortable in my role is that is that growing up you know, it could well be. but I, I think I think if I had started training at a later age, I probably would have still had the same battles. I still would have felt like I needed to... Oh, I've been joined by my cat. Nigel, don't stand on the mic. <laughs> um, Who's this? Nigel? This is Nigel. Hello, Nigel. Uh, see your tail? Can see tail. All of our listeners. Oh, he's handsome. He is handsome. Lovely, yes. lovely black cat. Laura has been joined by a lovely black cat. He's slightly in the way. But... Now trying to pick her nose with his tail. <laughs> I'd have such bad imposter syndrome. No, um, I. I close it properly. There you go. <laughs> I think it is. I definitely think the profession comes with struggles, and like, we all know it's a stressful profession to be in. But I also think that even in the 15 years that I've been in the profession, so much has changed, and now there's so much talked about that never was before. And I think that's only going to get better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you were writing to your 17 year old self. What, what take-home points would you put in that note? You're doing better than you think. Okay. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay. I think are probably my biggest two. Yeah. I, I think I needed to have got you to write a letter to my 17-year-old self. I, <laughs> I wonder if you would have listened. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you like teaching. I do, yeah, I really like teaching like teaching sort of hour-long sessions or minute-long sessions or oh, oh, see, what, <laughs> see what you're doing here julian hang on you see what i'm, you see what I'm doing i see where this is going <laughs> um i have never taught a minute-long session before but i get the feeling that i might be about to <laughs> what, what you could try what about it <laughs> that's, that's interesting because we have a section on veterinary ramblings called 60 seconds cpd and you've led us straight to it. Amazing, Laurie. How do you manage to twist the, uh, <laughs> the conversation around to that? Do, are you up for the challenge? Yes. Let's do it. I, I'm almost up for the challenge of getting the timer going right. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only the 90th episode we're recording. We're not quite ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> so... Laura found that out right at the very start when That's right. <laughs> the co-host hadn't turned up. Yeah. 
But we'll forget. We'll edit that bit out. We'll forget all about. No problem. No problem at all. Forget all about. No okay. Yes. So, Laura Jones, LVN, you've you've come across the sixty second CPD challenge. I have. Yeah. Are you up for it? I am. What would you like to do your sixty second CPD on? I'm um, going to talk about nurse clinics for chronic disease patients. Nurse. Chronic disease patients, right? Okay, so Laura Jones, RVN, nurse clinics for chronic disease patients. Your one minute starts now. Okay, so there are six things that we want to do to perform a clinic for chronic disease patients. Really simply, the first thing that you want to do is collect an updated clinical history. The second thing that you want to do is perform a thorough physical examination, so a top to tail exam tailored to the individual and their different disease process. After this, we're going to grab all of the diagnostic samples that we need under the vet's direction, probably including a blood pressure and a dipstick in specific gravity as well if the client can bring in a urine sample. Next up, we're going to provide advice on medication administration, nutrition, hydration, exercise, mobility, environment and lifestyle at home and quality of life. And then we're going to dispense any repeat prescriptions that have been prescribed and book a follow-up appointment, summarise everything that's been discussed in the appointment, make sure we don't need to action anything with the vet before the client leaves and check that they don't have any questions. Is the time for wow. a question? Is that 57 <laughs> seconds CPD? That, that, was, that was fantastic. <laughs> now, what, why do you need to give an hour-long seminar when you got that in, in, in 57 yeah. seconds? Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic, Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's one a a hell of a summary. Yeah, I think you included everything, didn't you? Uh, Oh, no, you you forgot to write charge of. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Charge the client client appropriately. (laughs) That's brilliant. Really good. Really good. Do do you like doing client consults? I do. Yeah, I, I really do. I thought that would be one thing I never got to do in referral anymore. But actually, it's something I think I probably do more now than I did before. Mm-hmm. The n- nurses and, and, and vets are divided into those who do and those who don't like consulting. Yeah. And I think um, it's, it's a you know, 50-50 mix, isn't it, really? Yeah. I used to hate consulting, though. When I worked in GP, I absolutely hated it. But I think it's just because I wasn't doing the right consults for me. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But that was excellent, absolutely awesome. Yeah. 60 seconds CPD. Um, I've got a certificate. Have you? Yeah. I bet, I bet you haven't got one with a 1200cc bandit on it because one's a 1200cc. <laughs> no, I've, I've got that though. I've got a little moped with a shopping bag on it. <laughs> <laughs> now, More going at 153 more. miles an hour in yeah, that would be that one in eight seconds. That'd be great. <laughs> Truly yeah. something. So there you go. It says certificate of the need for speed. This certifies that drag racing is probably safer than you think. <laughs> at the bottom, yeah, Ronnie reckon. <laughs> there's there's a, a loaf of uh, of rye sourdough. Amazing. You there? It's your favourite. And um, look, this is the difference here between between medical nursing and surgical nursing. So here's. This is a uh, marking, local anaesthetic, and there's a catheter. It's a fenestrated catheter. So what I'm doing is putting that into a wound and injecting local anaesthetic into it. I can do that. What you nurses have to do as medical nurses is to try and figure out how these three-way <laughs> taps work. And that's, that's, that's been so easy. many years. It's completely <laughs> impossible. You need a degree for that. You do. Um, you do. You do. And, and finally, of course, there, there's imposter syndrome. There's, uh, there's me. Uh, imposterizing myself as a clown uh, and I showed that to my very good friends Popol and Kay Cole who are real clowns and they said no you're an imposter we can tell instantly you're not a real clown from that so true imposter syndrome there and I think I also <laughs> uh, but but if you uh, if you download that and um, uh, submit it to, to the RCVS that'll uh, That'll be a full minutes CPD. Amazing. I put that on my one CPD. <laughs> oh, oh, no, it's not, is it? What, 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 Julian? It, it's not really, it's not a full minute, is it? Because you've got to... Uh, oh, 57 seconds. You got to, No, you've got to reflect on it. Oh. So there's your extra three seconds. That's great. I can do a three-second reflection. Fab. Okay, do you want to do a three-second reflection on that? 
Oh, did I just volunteer to do that on the podcast? Thank you. I thought you did. I, I, missed... I meant on the podcast. I thought I heard it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I reflect on it and I determine that I missed the men- to mention charging and that as nurses, we absolutely should charge for our time. So next time I do uh, a 60 second CPD, I'll make sure I add that in. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well done because your time is worth it. Absolutely right. Yeah. So have you got a reflection question for our audience? something to reflect on um, going forwards, whether that's related to the CPD or something completely different. What what would you like our our listeners to reflect on? Uh, I'm going to share, I think, probably what's one of the most valuable things that I've learned. And it's nothing to do with my CPD, actually. It's about life in practice, more so, I guess, about like the imposter syndrome, mental health side of things. And that's to always think about what lies beneath the behaviour or the words or the action that you're confronted with. So if a client puts in a complaint about you, don't just take that at face value. Have a look at what is underneath that. If you're on the receipt of a harsh word from a colleague, have a look at what actually could be beneath that and what could have caused that. It doesn't change the fact that you've been spoken to badly. It doesn't change the fact that a client's put in a complaint, for example, but I find if you can try and understand what could be going on for that person or what might have motivated them to act that way, it makes it easier to understand and not kind of think too much uh, about the actual specifics of what's been said. So yeah. anytime that someone, I, like it's definitely not something I'm perfect at and it's always something that I will continue to practice, but it helps me not take like, harsh words harsh words from a colleague on a stressful day to heart so that's something i always try and reflect on that's interesting that's empathy again excellent excellent reflection it, it's difficult to do isn't it in the heat of the moment and and, and, uh, and a, a client or, or a or a colleague is is bad mouthing you it it's a difficult thing a really noble thing to be able to think they've had a bad day their their, their, their mum's just being run over by vicar and a tractor or you know whatever whatever can happen on a daily basis and, uh, yeah yeah and it doesn't like it doesn't excuse that but it just helps me personally understand it and I'm like oh okay it's not about me this client's put a complaint in because their pet's been euthanized and they're grieving and they're angry because they're grieving for example like it just helps to rationalize it so to take a step back and put yourself in their shoes a little bit yeah yeah so that's that's the whole empathy thing normally when that happens to me it's because i've been a twat <laughs> and i <I've> fully <laughs> deserve it but, yeah, but put, uh, we put our hands up yeah you're absolutely right i'm swear i've done that yeah yeah <laughs> i'm gonna try that <laughs> <laughs> my my first boss said to me look you're not gonna be able to please everyone he said you do as good a job as you can and you're not gonna be able to please everyone because someone's going to come in and the car's just broken down they've just been charged a thousand quid to repair it they dropped a carton of eggs on the way out of the door and, you know, everything's gone wrong for them and yet you're another person telling them news they don't want to hear at a price they don't want to hear uh and he said just you know be content in your own mind that you've done the best job you have and you'll get it right most of the time yeah absolutely so, good advice i think yeah wise words those Mm. Mm. so i always wear a t-shirt saying what you're fucking staring at you bastard and that way i think yeah puts the clients on the right footing doesn't it Mm. yeah (laughs) yeah what what do you say what not i think i'm not saying a word nothing zip zip (laughs) yeah Yeah, twice We 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 uh, we love each other really. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? What do you say? What do you say? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, right. Not say. Not nothing. It's never changed. Changing the subject. Kickboxing. Yeah. What, what, why? Why not? To be honest, I felt like I needed a bit of a stress relief from work, mm. not, like just from general practice life. Again, I think it's similar to the racing. Like I needed some kind of 
escape, yeah. some sort of outlet for, like, just an escape from, like, like you said earlier, you know, when you exercise, all you're doing is thinking about what you're doing in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I had done various things before, like I used to be a runner and then I got injured and fell out of love with that. And I just felt like I needed a new sport mm-hmm. to get into mm-hmm. and I wanted something that I could kind of progress in uh, and develop in so yeah I went for a trial kickboxing session and then haven't stopped going since to be honest. It, is it a sort of formally trained process so I, I, I did karate as a kid and you, you go through the belt system is that the same thing with kickboxing? Yeah yeah so I've got a grading in two weeks I think three, just under three weeks so yeah we grade every two months and you, you progress through the belts and things and then as you progress, it, there's the opportunity to compete if you want to, but I don't think that's something I'll ever do. I, I mainly just do it uh, to, if, as a fun way to keep fit and also to work on things like flexibility and balance and, and stuff like that. Sure. Okay, I'll, scratch, I don't know if you... I'll scratch the question about what's it actually like to climb onto the ring for the first time. <laughs> Absolutely no idea and probably not something I'm going to do. Right. So you don't fancy doing a, a kickboxing demonstration at BSAVA Congress next year? <laughs> I think there are probably a lot of people who are much better at kickboxing than me that could do a demonstration. There's that imposter syndrome again. Absolutely. It sounds like a yes to me. I'll put you well, there. That probably yeah. isn't it? Give me a few more belts and maybe. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, there'll be never enough belts before. No, no, this is this. You've got to get this self-talk going, this positive yeah. self-talk, this reaffirmation stuff going. Just remember that letter that you wrote to your 17-year-old self? Yes. Yeah, I've yeah. managed it with veterinary medicine, but not quite with kickboxing yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> Actually, the, the one the, there's, there's probably two people here you probably could get into a ring with with perfect confidence. Because... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We, we just run. <laughs> my, my, my karate days are 40 years in the past <laughs> but remember she can kick too yes <laughs> brutal I did, I did um no i did karate actually till almost brown belt level when i was very young uh, i was in um i was in a competition once my, my first ever competition I, uh, I was pitched against someone who was about six foot three, and um, and I kicked them in the in the face. Or I would have done had they not actually moved aside at the last minute, and I kicked the wall and broke my toe. And that was that was the end of that competition. Ouch! <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure you've got a brown belt for something different. <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, I'd get a brown belt if I went 150 miles an hour on one of those motorbikes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Laura, we, we've mentioned your website a few times, and it is a very, very glossy, glitzy website with uh, some lovely photos of, of that, uh, that that Doberman. Um, now, there's an awful lot you can learn from your website, but also you can people can contact you, can't they, via your website, and that's... Uh, Veterinary Internal Medicine Nursing Medicine Nursing dot com. I'll say it again. Veterinary oh, Internal Medicine Nursing dot com. Okay. And they can uh, they can get a free guide to setting up medical nursing clinics in their practice if they email you. Is that right? Yeah, there's lots of free stuff on there. So there's the blog, which has got at this point probably about eighty or so posts of different things that like different medical topics. There's a free resource library, free webinars. Uh, there's also a store that's got like some workshops and, and things in there as well, uh, if people want to take it further. But there's also like a ton of free CPD on there for anyone who wants to learn more about medicine. Cool. Or they can buy one of your many veterinary nurse pocket guides. So <laughs> hey. I particularly like the, uh, the pocket guide to respiratory disease. Uh, and Mike's got some pocket guides as well. The all you ever wanted to know about capnography we were afraid to ask. Oh, amazing. There you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so, good. What, what, brought the, what brought the website about? What made you do that? So 
in complete honesty, uh, the practice that I was working in before my current practice made some changes to the structure of the nurses. And as part of that, med- the medicine nurse role went. Right. And along with that, my role kind of disappeared. So I've spent a few years at this point developing this passion and this niche in medical nursing, only to then find myself not able to do that anymore. Uh, so I wanted to try and find an alternative outlet for everything that I had kind of learned and around the same time I had done my VTS and I thought well why don't I take the information that I learned for my VTS and put it out there for more people to learn from so yeah it's pretty altruistic it is it is it's not all altruistic because there's a shop you can buy things from uh but actually they're very reasonably priced and there's a whole wealth of of, uh, of informational bits and bobs you can get from it so i'd strongly recommend all our listeners to go on to veterinary internal medicine nursing.com and have a look brilliant excellent stuff thanks <laughs> yeah listen it, it's uh, i don't know if, if we can help in any way then we, that's what we like to try and do yeah yeah makes the world a much nicer place and uh we all we all learn stuff at all times and when we finished uh, chatting with you laura this evening we'll probably carry on and we'll learn more stuff as well so um no it's been very good it's been a pleasure to meet you as well i mean i'm, I'm fascinated by the diversity in your life laura between vet nurse a bit of teaching you've got your own website and you're gonna race 1200 cc <laughs> motorcycles <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, I kind of ended up having to do it. My other half runs a motorbike repair shop from a workshop in our garden. So, like, there's motorbikes everywhere at this point in my life. So, if you can't beat them, you might as well join them, I guess, is kind of the attitude I've ended up with. Yeah, probably would. But speak, talking of um, going fast and, and time, um, I'm ever so sorry, Laura, but it, it behoves us to say that uh, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, don't forget to get in touch with us. And uh, please subscribe because it really does make a difference and help. And you'll find us on all of the normal regular channels where you normally download your podcasts or, of course, you can check out the video. So, um, Laura Jones, thank you very, very much indeed for giving us an insight into your life. Yeah, thank you. Thank Um, you. All it remains for us to do is say thank you and may your dog go with you. May your dog go with you. Cheers. Cut. Yay. Oh, breathe. You can breathe. Now. You can breathe. Yay. Did you, have you enjoyed yourself this evening? Laura? Oh, I have. It's been a great laugh. Good. Yeah. You didn't feel uh, put under under the spotlight or the pressure. Too. No, not at all. And it's nice to have like slightly more random conversations, which I knew it would be right. Like I knew that was what was going to happen. But like it's nice because normally you go on a podcast and it's like the same questions about only clinical stuff, and it's nice to just have something more refreshing and a bit different. 